Hello everyone, David here. It's time for the next adventure, which is a trip to Chernobyl, the site of the nuclear accident in 1986. Um, it's something I've been meaning to do for a while since I was visiting Kiev and noticed it was just close by on the map. Um, and today's the day to take a tour and finally have a look around and try and get a real sort of personal feel for what it's like. Okay, let's go. I am Sergei Mirny and uh, I was an officer of radiation surveillance uh, in Chernobyl in the first month in the, in the summer of 1986. I arrived on the 13th of July and I left on the 18th of August. So it was uh, 35 days and nights in total. I am saying days and nights because it was around the clock uh, occupation, so to say. And do you remember when you first arrived and your first impression and what you saw then? The impression which I had before uh, arriving to Chernobyl was that Chernobyl is something local. You know, and then, you know, when I started to, to, to drive there, I realized how many people and resources, you know, were uh, concentrated in this area. Uh, and uh, then the, 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 the contamination and consequences, they went beyond this uh, yeah, ideal geometric circle, you know, it was actually much longer. And so I realized that it's a huge, a huge territory. So, well, I discovered the whole country, you know, with its own environment, uh, its own rules, you know. So I'm here with my wife, Svetlana, who has foolishly agreed to come with me. Um, and we also have our tour guide, Olena. Hello. Hello. Hi, boss. She told me, uh, you go there as a tourist once and you will feel it, whether you will like it or you will hate it. And kind of, I loved it because even now when I say it, my hairs are up and I have it all the time because this is place is really special. You know, the author of this HBO series, when you listen to his podcast, he said that I, when I visited this place, I could feel that this is the most religious place on our planet. Mm. You know, this is kind of special place for really. me. So we're going just for one day, yeah. but you go there five days a week? In the high season that we have high now, season. yes. And so are you at all worried about the amount of radiation you're accumulating? No, because I know how to control it with the help of Geiger counter. So I control the level of radiation at each step of my trip. Okay. And in the end of the day, I can see my total radiation dose of the day. And it shows me the dose that usually equals to one hour of a flight. Is there a lot of interest in doing yes. a tour and in the yes. site and the street? Definitely. Like one month ago, there was one person in the bus who knows about the series. Uh, two weeks ago there was like half of the bus who already saw the film and one man who just booked the tour only because mm -hmm. of the series. Yes, and this week already the full bus is <laughs> aware of the series, not because, but they watched it and they asked questions. Mm -hmm. What is true, what is not. So what's like the biggest uh, either lie or thing they got accidentally wrong in the TV series? Mm -hmm. What? liquidators say that the film is good it is really beautiful and it raises awareness what they feel uncomfortable about is that series showed the soviet version of the accident of the reasons of the accident so the soviet union put all the blame on people who were operators of the power plant yeah dad loved blame yes he was guilty the main the director main engineer his deputy so these are people who are guilty that was the soviet version the last conclusion says that people are not guilty. They were given unstable reactor that had to explode sooner or later. The whole Soviet system is to blame. They can't in the series they show the Soviet system yeah. to blame, but at the same they blame the people. And by the way, we already arrived, guys. So that's the checkpoint in front of us. The Chernobyl exclusion zone, the gates, yes. Uh, we are very lucky to be one of the first and I will do the paperwork because bureaucracy is everything in the Soviet Union. So let's break through the system. Okay, cool. Thank cool. You. Yeah. So knowing I was coming to Chernobyl, obviously I wanted to buy a Geiger counter so I could take my own readings. Um, and I took it a few different places to measure it. Like here I am in Kiev. 
and I'm getting under 0.2 microsieverts per hour, which is like really low base level sort of worldwide. It's like next to nothing. You would get a lot more than this on a typical flight. And in fact, on the flight over here from London, I got peaking at 2.6 microsieverts per hour, um, which is over 10 times as much um, and a fair bit more in the X-ray scanner as well as it got scanned in security. Um, but I took it to a few other places to take some other measurements like um, Trafalgar Square the Victoria Line northbound, backstage at a rock concert. And of course, at Chernobyl. Uh, and I took it to the Ferris wheel um, in the fun fair in Pripyat, where there are a couple of hotspots. And Olina showed me just what the readings were like there. So what we have here is the highest hotspot. It's very small, so you need to be a really professional guide or really good tourist to find it, yes? Okay. okay. Um, usually, like, I know that the more sensitive part of my Geiger counter is here. Mm -hmm. So this is what show, will show me the correct numbers. Right. And I know that I need to be very close to the hotspot mm -hmm. and to freeze for like 5-10 seconds, okay? okay. okay. So I'm, there are two marked crosses. These are the hotspots. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so some yes, good guides, yes marketed for future generations. Mm. Now what I do else, I just uh, check my dose of the day, 0 mm -hmm. 0.003 millisieverts. Okay. Yes, and now I will, uh, when you will be measuring hotspot, don't press it to the surface, not to contaminate your guide account. No, no, I don't Okay, so are you ready? Yeah. yeah. So let's try it. Here we go, it was one microsievert. And now it's 311. Wow. 330, 374. Well, 374, not bad. 377, it peaked up. 380, 385, 384. Well, kind of, maybe enough for us. 395. <laughs> yeah, I think you made your point. <laughs> yes, yes, I just wanted to reach 400. Okay. So that's 0.4 millisieverts. And at this point, it's only 1.8. Wow, so there's a real difference in distance. Yeah. We say like that for some people, if there is no Geiger counter, no radiation. I can see <laughs> that meaning doesn't exist, but it's there anyway. And when you are standing here without Geiger counter, it's anywhere. Mm. So if I put my hand, it will be there. Mm. If I put my hand with the Geiger, it will be there, but I will uh, see what exactly mm. is there. Mm. So 0 0.003 was my dose. Mm. What do you see here now? 0.07. Seven. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you've So more once than again it doubled, more than doubled. Oh, 0 0.003 was the dose of the day and it doubled only because of that passport. Okay, let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so well we were working on a, on a certain scale and you know it, it, it just put at, at the top of it which I did not expect. And, and so I thought that it's something wrong. I switched to the next scale and it, uh, it only just weakly moved uh, 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 near the zero. And so, you know, I, I thought that something is wrong with the dosimeter. And only later on I realized that the last scale uh, was not uh, 10 times uh, bigger, but it was uh, the maximum was uh, uh, no, no, not 5 rungeons per hour, but, two, but 200 rungeons oh per God. hour. You know, and this weak movements meant uh, 10 rungeons per hour, which is uh, 0 0.1 uh, zeverts uh, yeah, per, per hour, you know. But when I realized it, I said, okay, guys, we jumped and we immediately, immediately ran there. Uh, so we've just seen uh, Lenin Square and some of the old hotels and other buildings and um, so 30 years on from the accident one thing that really strikes me is just how quickly nature reclaims all of the buildings. Um, you know they've decayed as you would expect but really the amount of trees and sort of lush greenery and stuff that's grown around them as well um, and things in flower and blooming uh, are really surprising but also quite sweet to see as well.
that was one big swimming pool. The interesting story about it is that it was in use even after the accident until 90s. In my first uh, tour to the Chernobyl zone in 1986, uh, 1986 uh, I also felt unsure and nervous, no, not so much because of radiation, but in general, you know. And now I see, uh, and but here, you know, here I am, here are the folks, the fellow homo sapiens like me, you know, who, who, who feel uh, quite uh, sure uh, about this uh, place, you, you know. And so I realized that, that it's very important in such uh, extreme environments, uh, th there should be someone with you uh, who, who kind of, uh, who is in control of this environment, you know. And this uh, psychological uh, uh, assurance, or how shall I say it, you know, uh, uh, psycho psychological robustness, so to say, it, it is conveyed uh, to, to other people. So why is it safe but not completely? Because uh, most of these elements that decayed from, that were uh, raised by the wind from reactor, yes, uh, that was the whole spectrum. But most of these elements already decayed because of short half-life period, but some of them remained. So like here we have the hotspot, 31 microsieverts per hour, 36, and, and at this point it's less, they're completely invisible. Mm -hmm. So most of these elements, they decay because of their short half-life period. For example, iodine 131 has half-life period of 8 days only. That means in 8 days half of it disappears, in another 8 days another half disappears. So we don't have iodine anymore. When we had it, it resulted into the thousands of thyroid cancers among Ukrainian children, even in Belarus, in France, in Italy as well. And back in the days, it was enough, you know, to measure thyroid of a person to understand if it has radiation inside, some iodine, because our thyroid absorbs no matter which iodine, radioactive or not. What remains still is cesium, strontium and plutonium. Most of plutonium in the reactor, other elements are cesium strontium. Their half-life period is about 30 years. So that means in 33 years that passed, only half of it disappeared, half of it remains. And plutonium, some isotopes of plutonium have half-life period of 24,000 of years. So only in 24,000 of years, half of plutonium will disappear. We can continue calculation and we will figure out that, well, maybe never is the correct word for this. Several of our routes, uh, they were uh, they were going to, to the north uh, from, from this exploded unit. There, there is a, a road there. And so from this route, we can see from the distance, uh, 300 meters, 400 meters, this open gate, you know, well, r r rather an unpleasant view. Uh, but anyway, you know, we drove along the road, which was more or less uh, decontaminated uh, at that time. Uh, once we have uh, we, we had an, an, an adventure when we were, when we were making surveillance a uh, couple of hundred meters uh, further from the unit along the railway track in the forest. This place was uh, was less contaminated, and we got stuck there. You know, and it was exactly you know uh, so in front of this gate, you know, wow. and so it was kind of unpleasant to get stuck in such a place, and so we were to, to leave the, the armored vehicle, which reduces the, the radiation threefold. You know, and to go by foot, you know, for 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 a tow vehicle, you know. So, but anyway. 1.3 here, a little higher, so in terms of radiation, uh, this place is m more dirty than the others. We came from the stairs, unfortunately crumbling already. So let's check radiation in this corner and see what our Geiger counter shows us. Well, for the moment nothing happens, 
I can hear some sound of more clicks than before. So it's only 1.5 microsieverts. And we will remeasure it downstairs. Okay, and let's see what do we have here. And here we have, well, 30 microsieverts per hour. 28. So why, David, do we have more radiation downstairs than upstairs? Did it wash up from the river or something? Not from the river, but down the river. Oh, because right. radiation was coming from the air, so they were washing the buildings, the streets. The rain was doing the same job, so water was, you know, coming down and some particles accumulated. Mm. So all the holes, all the cracks in asphalt, all the corners, all the places with the most are potential hotspots in Pripyat. On the other hand, we were told, oh, you are so huge heroes. On the other hand, we, we were considered, you know, as walking ruins, you know, kind of who, who will die, you know, on any moment, you, you know. And so uh, it, it was uh, rather unpleasant pre pressure. Uh, when people were leaving the place, they thought they were going to come back soon, in a couple of days only, but they never could do that. So what was left had to be deactivated in very simple way. So liquidators just had to throw everything from balconies, from the windows, load it on trucks and take it to the burial site and bury under the ground as radioactive waste.